It is, of course, good to be with you again this morning. Um, I am a child uh, of the 80s. I was born in 1977. That makes me 43 years old. And I know that's hard to believe with hair this good, right? Right? Uh, I, I am a child of the 80s, and, and I remember, remember vividly on, on Friday nights, uh, one of the things our family would do is we would uh, get a pizza, and, and we would rent our, our VHS tape, and, and we would watch a movie. And more times than not, the, the, the foe of that, that movie would always be a spy, Right? I, I grew up on movies like uh, James Bond and, and Mission Impossible and, and The Hunt for the Red October. Uh, the, these were my youth, right? The, 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 the classic spy versus spy is just an iconic image uh, of the Cold War, and, and rightfully so. I mean, after all, arguably one of uh, America's greatest defeats came not in battle, but at the hands of a spy, World War II was the deadliest conflict in human history. An estimated 50 to 56 million people died as a direct casualty of that terrible war. And, and when you extend that count out to those who were indirect casualties, those who, who died through famine or disease, that number balloons to, to 85 million people. Now, now understand, that's 3% of the world's population in 1940. And so in 1940, at the start of World War II, 3% of the world's population would die by the end of that conflict. World War II was the deadliest conflict in human history, and it was ended by the deadliest moments in human history. Right? On August 6, 1945, an American B-29 uh, dropped one atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. And in one terrifying moment, 80,000 people lost their lives, and the world was changed. Three days later, a second bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki, killing 40,000 individuals. Now, this second bomb resulted in, in the surrender of Japan and the beginning of the end of World War II, and after World War II, after the war, the U.S. emerged as just an unrivaled superpower, right? There was, there was no one that, that could match us. You know, as a nation, we had suffered losses, but for the most part, man, that 3,000 miles of ocean had protected us from the worst of it, at least compared to Europe and Asia. Uh, we, we, were, we were still relatively strong. And that 3,000 miles of ocean in the post-war era, continued to protect us from, from anyone that, that would come against us. And if that wasn't enough, well, then there was still the bomb, right? No one could mess with the USA after World War II. At the end of World War II, all of the U.S.'s external threats had been neutralized or at least they were held at bay for the moment, but this new level of security, and this safety, it came with an incredible responsibility. We had to protect the bomb. I mean, if the contesting powers of this world could kill 56 million people with tanks and guns, what would happen if atomic weapons proliferated? Sadly, the U.S. was not successful at protecting this dreadful secret. In 1949, just four years after the deployment of the f world's first atomic bomb, Soviet Russia initiated a successful detonation of an atomic bomb, and the Cold War was on. This Cold War would come to dominate geopolitics and uh, really culture for the, for the next 40 years. And see, at the end of World War II, everyone knew that, that Russia would eventually get the bomb, right? That, that was America's greatest fear. We knew that there would come a time when Russia would have that too, and, and, and there would be uh, a rival on, on the world stage. But the world was shocked at how fast they had done it. How had they been able to accomplish this? The short answer? Spies. 
right? America was safe from all external threats. There was no soldier that could pose a realistic challenge. But an internal threat? That's a different matter entirely. A spy was more dangerous than a soldier because a few well-placed spies, hidden and unnoticed, could do what, what an army of soldiers never could. And so, two weeks ago, we looked at how external hardships can be a threat to our joy. And we took notice of how we combat those external hardships with gratitude and with a radical submission to God's will, trusting that God is in control, that, that God is at work. Today, I want to take some time and we're going to look at a, a covert threat that secretly and, and covertly undermines our joy. That covert threat, that, that internal threat that I'm talking about is the threat of pride. Pride is an internal threat that often robs us of the joy that God, God has for us. Now, if you remember two weeks ago, we started a, a series going through the book of Philippians. And uh, we're going to take, uh, well, the next a total of five weeks to, to go through this book chapter by chapter. And so as we get started, I want to encourage you to open up to Philippians 2. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to go there because we're going to be looking at that text in quite a bit of detail. And, uh, but before we go there, I want to I kind of set the stage, remind us of some things that we learned last week. Uh, if you remember, the book of Philippians is really a letter. Uh, a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church that he started in, in the city of Philippi. And, and Paul is writing this letter from the confines of a prison cell, hundreds of miles away from the Philippians. He's, he's sitting in Rome in a, in a prison cell awaiting a trial, a, a trial for, for preaching the gospel. And, and, and Paul is facing a lot of uncertainty. He doesn't know if he's going to be uh, let go or whether he'll be executed. E either one could happen. And the reason for Paul's writing of this letter is he's writing because there's a conflict that's ignited in the Philippian church. And, and Paul, Paul wants to address it. And, and this conflict that's taken place, it's, it's taken place between two individuals that, that are key leaders in the church, and Paul loves and respects them both. And so in chapter 1, he focuses his attention on those external hardships that we face. Right? Right? And he says that when we face them with gratitude, we can still have joy e even in the midst of these, this hardship, even in the midst of persecution. And then Paul encourages them to rejoice because God is at work in those difficult circumstances. Now in chapter 2, Paul is turning his attention to that internal threat. An internal threat that, if left unchecked, would rob them of their joy and their unity and it would destroy and undermine their, their witness to the world. Let's take a look at what Paul has to say. This is chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. It says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. What Paul is saying is, is that the things that we've received from Christ, those, those things should, we should naturally be offering those things to each other in, in our relationships. And so if we've received love, encouragement, Tenderness and compassion, these things need to be coming a part of who we are and they, they naturally flow out of who we are as we interact with each other and, and the world uh, outside of our doors. If you come to my house, this is really the inside scoop that I'm about to give you. So write this down. <laughs> if you come to my house during the holidays, yes, <laughs> Randy's paying attention. If you come to my house, Randy, uh, during the holidays, there's a really good chance that I'm going to offer you pie, right? You know, my father, who lives with us, has 
a fondness of pie. And so it seems like from, from, from Thanksgiving all the way through the first of the year, he makes sure that we have a steady supply of pie coming in the, in the door. And so it's only natural that if you come to visit during the holidays, that I'm going to share with you out of the abundance of what's been given to me, right? My father's pie, <laughs> Right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share out of that abundance and, and you're going to get to enjoy it. That's kind of what Paul is saying here. The things that we've received from Christ, we are in turn offering to others as those things are reflected in our character. And so again, I want to read those verses. It says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, and being one in spirit and one mind. As we follow Jesus, the love of Jesus is reflected out from us. Right? Ultimately, this creates in us a change in, in, in our motives. Right? The priorities of Jesus suddenly become our priorities. And, and so our motivations change, and they become altruistic and, and humble rather than self-seeking and, and prideful. The work of Christ in our life empowers us to root out that internal threat that would, to, to joy that, that, that would rob us of our joy and unity. As we follow Christ, the well-being of, our, uh, of others becomes as important to us as our own personal well-being. And this is how we're able to finally love our neighbor as ourselves. In the next couple of verses in, in, in Philippians, Paul gives us a description of what this looks like. And if you notice, I, I want you to take a look at your text because you, most English translations, you'll, you'll notice something. There's a formatting change that takes place, right? The, 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 it goes from these block paragraphs to this indented uh, every other line formatting. Well, that's really significant because it's trying to tell us something about the text. It, it shifts to something that's poetic or artistic, and the reason for that is because it's a hymn or, or, or a creed. And, and, and that is very significant in this particular passage because it tells us that the words that are being shared are something that the people of Philippians knew well. Right? This is, this is a short creed or, or hymn that they would have taught to their, their kids and to each other, and it's written in such a way as to be memorized. Right? Paul is not giving them new information. He's, he's reciting what they've already hold to be true. And so listen to what he has to say there. He says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of, as Christ Jesus. And this is the creed. This is the, this is the part. It says, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, by taking on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place and he gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." That's, that's, that's the creed. That, that's that, that nugget that I'm talking about, that hymn. Like, they would have memorized this and, and, and shared this from person to person. And so Paul isn't giving them anything new. He's just reinforcing what they already know. And I want to take this, this little hymn, this little creed, and break it into two parts. Because the truth in it is really significant. First off, it's affirming the deity of Christ. In verse 6, it says, who being in very nature God, right? With this statement, Paul is making it clear that Jesus is God, right? This is what the early church believed about him. He's not saying that Jesus was like God. He's not saying that he was, um, you know, had some, of, some godly qualities. He's not even saying that God's spirit rests on him. He's saying that he is God. It, it would be like me saying that this, this podium over here is, is metal, right? I'm telling you what it's made of, what its characteristics are. It, it is of that substance. 
And, and that's what Paul's trying to say here, that Jesus is divine. He is God. And, and that statement, when we recognize the divinity of Christ, it makes the next point that I'm going to say, it, it just sets off the magnitude of that point. And this is that, that Jesus demonstrated the full measure of humi humility. For Jesus to fulfill the plan that God had for him, he had to set aside his rights and privileges as God. The text tells us that he made himself nothing. Some texts translate it this way. It says that he emptied himself. But the message is clear. Jesus, the, 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 the king of heaven, right? Co-creator of the, the universe, God in the flesh gave up all of those rights and privileges of being God, all of that power and prestige. He, he gave those things up so that he could come and pay the price for our sin. Right? Paul is encouraging us to have that same kind of humility. See, pride often makes us resistant to God's will in our lives. God calls us to action and we resist because we believe we deserve better. Or, or, or we're scared, <laughs> fearful of the sacrifice. Pride is a covert threat that, that, that can defeat God's people when an army of persecutors wouldn't stand a chance. And so this brings us to the, the most relevant question for today. What rights and privileges will you set aside so that you can see God's will uh, come about in your life? Pride is such a covert foe, it hides within our secret thoughts and it whispers lies in our quiet moments. Pride tells us that our race and our nationality warrants privilege. And pride tells us that our wealth, whether it be through inheritance or through good old-fashioned hard work or some combination of the two, that, that that warrants privilege. Our pride tells us that our intelligence and our education warrants privilege. Pride tells us that our talents warrant privilege. Pride tells us that our age, whether we be young or old, that that somehow sets us above the, the rest and that it warrants privilege. Pride would even tell us that our pursuit of righteousness and our faith warrants privilege. See, pride often makes us resistant to God's work in our lives because eventually, if you're following Jesus, you're going to have to set aside your rights and privileges. Right? To follow Jesus into forgiveness, you have to set aside your rights and privileges. To, to follow Jesus into service, you have to set aside your rights and privileges. To have meaningful fellowship with each other, we have to set aside our rights and privileges. As you follow Jesus, you will face a choice. You can have your rights and privileges, or you can forgive. You can have your rights and privileges, or you can serve. You can have your rights and privileges or you can have meaningful relationship. You can have your rights and privileges or you can experience God's work in you and through you. That's the choice that we face. And that's the choice that Paul is trying to bring to the Philippians' attention. And he's telling them, follow the example of Jesus, who being in very nature God, set aside all all of those rights and privileges so that he could come and take the lowest of positions. He could come and be a servant to, to mankind, to humanity, a slave, the text says. Not only does Jesus take this incredibly low position as a servant, but he also endures the disdain of those he came to serve. Jesus was obedient to the point of death even a death as disgraceful as the cross. Like, the, the cross has been completely recontextualized in our minds, right? To us, the cross is a, is a symbol of hope. 
It is a symbol of salvation. It's a symbol of grace and mercy. But to the people of Rome, the cross was a symbol of shame. It was a disgrace, a judgment, a scorn. The cross was a punishment that was reserved for the worst of the empire's enemies. And so when those soldiers pounded those nails into Jesus' hands, when they broke the skin on his back with that cat of nine tails, when they smashed that crown of thorns on his head, when they mocked him and spit at him, they believed they were doing their nation a service. Right? They believed that Jesus deserved it. In the cross, Jesus takes on disgrace and consequences that he did not deserve. And he did it so that we could have a relationship with God that we don't deserve. Jesus did it so that we could understand the full measure of God's love for us. Again, something we don't deserve. It's a beautiful part of Jesus' story. But we're not all the way through that little hymn, are we? There's more. Jesus' story doesn't end with the cross. It, it goes on. And so as a result of Jesus' humility, God has exalted Jesus. And this is that second part of that creed or that hymn. It says, therefore... God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The rights and privileges that Jesus set aside, God has restored to him. And the day is coming when at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And Paul gives us these three locations because he wants us to understand the significance of this declaration. God, Jesus isn't just going to rule an earthly kingdom. No, he, he's going to rule the universe. In each of these locations, there's an, there's an intelligence that's associated with it. In heaven, we have the angelic beings the host of heaven, right? In all of their majesty and their glory, they're going to bow to Jesus. The day is coming when humanity, no matter how broken or stubborn, no, no, no matter how self-assured and arrogant we are, we're going to bow to the lordship of Jesus. Every one of us. We're going to recognize him for what he is and we're going to quit lying to ourselves. But it doesn't stop there either. Even hell, with Satan and the demonic powers that have confused and corrupted humanity, they will bow to the lordship of Jesus. That's, that's the future. That day is coming. Now considering this, that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for our pride, does it? If, we, if Jesus is Lord and we consider his examples, example, we have to ask ourselves, doesn't it seem kind of foolish to demand our rights and privileges? Paul goes on in verse 12. He says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but, much, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now, that passage gets your attention. Specifically, that, that one line. Continue to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. You can't help but ask, what, what does Paul mean? Right? Why... Why is fear and trembling the appropriate response to Jesus' humility and, and God's exaltation of him? Gordon Fee, in his commentary in Philippians, explains it this way. And I, and I, I know I said the word commentary, and that's always dangerous. <laughs> but this is really good stuff. Listen to what he says. He says, fear and trembling is not to express our relationship or our emotion towards God, but rather our utter need and dependence on him. 
We are to approach the task with fear and trembling because we are wholly inadequate to carry it out. Our hope is found in the following line. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his great purpose. Right? Salvation, it isn't just about where we end up when we die. Right? It's not about whether we go to heaven or hell. I mean, that's part of it. Right? That is a future hope or a future consequence, depending on, on what you choose. But salvation is also about a transformation that we experience in this life. Right? The fear and trembling is to say that the stakes are high. Because in this life, we have a choice. We can be a fountain of living water that Jesus describes in John 8. Or we can be a fountain of, of pain and death and, and destruction. A person fighting cancer follows a detailed regiment uh, with diligence and obedience because the stakes are high. Right? In a sense, they do this with fear and trembling. In the same way, Paul is encouraging us to humbly follow Jesus' example. With obedience and diligence, we follow him because the stakes are high. If given a chance, Paul or pride would undermine all of that. Pride would have us demanding our rights and privileges rather than allowing God to work in and through us. And I'm telling you, it's a bad trade. Pride would have us hold on to an offense. It would have us burn with anger because uh, we were disrespected or our contribution wasn't recognized. Maybe your grievance is, is deeper than that. Maybe you've been deeply hurt and wounded. Pride would have you pick at those scabs, keeping those wounds fresh and bleeding every day, as if healing was somehow going to invalidate your suffering. Whatever you've experienced, I want you to know you don't have to live there. God offers you healing right now. Pride would have us demand restitution and remorse before we forgive, but God offers healing today. If you've been hurt, you have the right to be angry. But I'm telling you, it's a bad trade because God wants to offer you freedom and deliverance today. Pride would have you seek to be served when God is calling you to make a difference. We are surrounded by needs. Our world is often just a cacophony of, of people screaming to be heard and demanding that they be understood. And, and we can add to that cacophony if we want. Or we can be the one that sees the needs and chooses to step forward. Sure, it's not your job, but you can make a difference. As a young adult... I worked the midnight shift at a local gas station. And uh, the lady that managed that store, um, her name was Pat. And every morning, she would come in, she would gather the cleaning supplies, and she would go and she would clean the restroom top to bottom. And I remember, well, when she was done, then she would come over and take over and register, and I would go finish the morning chores. I would stock the cooler and do whatever else that needed to be done. And I remember that really spoke to me because she could have just taken over the register earlier and sent me to do the bathroom. But here it was, the, the highest ranking employee in that store constantly, consistently, daily did the, the, the lowest level job. And that spoke to me. It made me want to work for her. What if we showed up to work with that same servant's attitude? What might it say to our coworkers? to our employer, to those that work beneath us. Pride would have you demand that you get what you deserve, that everyone pulls their, pair, their fair share. But I'm telling you, it's a bad trade. 
Because God wants to use you. He wants to use you to reflect his love and his compassion and his character into your workplace. God wants to use you to make a difference in the lives of your coworkers. There is so much hurt in this world. And the reason that God has us still participating in this broken, <laughs> dilapidated world is because we are a source of healing. We take his character there, and people's first exposure to the Lord is often our kind words and our selfless actions. Pride would have you look the part, would have you respected and admired, maybe even envied, but also guarded and alone. I have people in my life that often tell me that people are no good. They can't be trusted. That they are shallow and selfish. And they're right to an extent. But my friends that, that, that say this, they have developed within themselves a deep disdain and cynicism about their fellow man. And if you share their sentiment, I want you to recognize that that, that sentiment, that attitude is just dripping with pride. And yes, there's risk in relationship. There's risk in community. People are going to hurt you. People are going to disappoint you. And pride would have you stay distant and isolated and protected from all of that. But I'm telling you, it's a bad trade. Because God wants to, to knit us into a deep, deep fellowship. And he might be calling you to be the one that, that builds that bridge of vulnerability that makes it possible. Pride wants to covertly rob us of joy and unity, but God wants us to experience those things in, in abundance. And the way forward is following the example of Jesus. The way forward is humility. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you, Lord, recognizing our own tendency to, to be prideful, right? To, to demand our rights and privileges when, when your example so clearly shows us that, that we are to lay those aside and, and focus solely on, on following uh, your voice. Lord, I pray that, that you'd give us eyes to see the needs around us and the courage to, to step out and to, to meet those needs. Lord, I pray for a closeness, that we would feel your spirit. And Lord, that that, uh, that would soothe our hearts and, and heal our hurts. Lord, I pray that you would use us as individuals, but Lord, also that you would use this church in a powerful way in this community. Lord, we ask this in your holy name. Amen.